When we last left off, Spain was freaking out. Basically, they discovered that Robert LaSalle and his settlers had established a settlement in Texas, and the Spanish, not knowing the purpose of this settlement, not knowing that it was intended to be built at the end of the Mississippi River, started to say, wow, somebody else is about to settle in this region unless we get people here soon. So what the Spanish determined to do is to look at Texas for the first time in a long time and say, how do we get people here? And we need to get people here very soon because it looks like the French are coming down in this direction. And if they're here and they start settling here, then very soon they're going to be down here where our silver and all our good stuff is. So the Spanish are going to determine to settle this area of Texas if only to provide a buffer for the silver of New Spain, the stuff where they're getting um, all the wealth from the New World, or at least a, a good chunk of the wealth is down here. So they're going to determine we need to sell this region, not because it has any material benefit for us, but because it has a benefit because it blocks the French. Okay, If we settle there, then the French can't settle there. So what the Spanish are going to start doing is coming up with ways to get people into Texas, okay? So they're going to have trouble finding civilian settlers because Texas obviously doesn't have the silver that you see down here. I mean, there's a tiny bit over here, but nothing compared to what you have down here. Um, it doesn't have, you know, uh, anything else of value. I mean, you, I guess you can grow some crops here, but, you know, the Spanish have Caribbean islands, things like that. They can grow a lot of those crops better. So how can we get people to settle in this region? Well, what the Spanish are going to determine is the best way to do uh, settlement in Texas and the, the easiest way and most importantly perhaps the cheapest way to get people in Texas is to establish missions. So we've talked about missions before basically instead of having to you know get a bunch of civilian settlers to go up there instead of having to pay a bunch of soldiers all you need is a handful of missionaries maybe a couple soldiers to protect them you go out among an Indian population and then you teach them how to be Christians. You teach them Spanish. You teach them how to grow European crops. And in a perfect world, at least perfect for the Spanish, after a couple years of uh, these missionaries being in an area, you would turn an Indian group that was either you know, uh, hostile to the Spanish or maybe didn't even really care about the Spanish. If missionaries are successful, after 10 years or so, you would have Spanish citizens. Now, as we mentioned, doesn't always work like that. A lot of times Indians reject missionaries, but sometimes missions worked. And we talked about last time the Pueblos missionaries had essentially converted the Pueblos uh, to Spanish ways over the course of 1598 to 1680. There was that Pueblo revolt, but after the Pueblo Revolt, the Pueblos started getting attacked by Apaches, and eventually they're going to allow the Spanish to return uh, to this area of New Mexico. So Spanish have control of New Mexico essentially because of missionaries. So what the Spanish are thinking is maybe we can do the same here in Texas. So you will see these various Spanish you know, thinkers, the Viceroy down in Mexico, uh, Mexico City, um, missionary leaders, uh, uh, leaders of the Catholic Church, they're going to start collecting all the information they have on the Indians of Texas to determine which ones would be the best to establish mission uh, missions among. So uh, some of this information is going to come all the way back from Cabeza de Vaca, you know, you're going to get a tiny bit from Coronado and DeSoto, but a lot of it's going to come from those expeditions that had sought out uh, Robert LaSalle you know, had uh, uh, discovered what was left of his fort. Those uh, missions had talked with these various Indians, and so they'd been among the Coaltecans, Caranquas, Caddos. There hadn't been much contact with the Wichitas up to this point, but the Spanish in New Mexico had plenty of uh, contact with the Apaches, and they also knew the Humanos and the Juntans. So the Spanish are going to look here and say, what Indians should we uh, establish ourselves among? What, who would be the perfect uh, to convert to, to Spaniards so we have this buffer to the French. Well, almost immediately the Spanish are going to rule out the Humanos and the Juntans. Um, as we'll talk about, there are a lot of good reasons to think, you know, maybe uh, missions would work among these guys. You know, as we talked about last time, there had been an attempt uh, to establish uh, missions among these groups before. 
um, but wasn't successful. But you know, maybe a second try would work. Well, it's maybe that's true, but it's not going to be uh, very helpful to what Spain is trying to do. We're trying to block the French. We know the French are up here. They're probably coming down through this river. They're going to be in this area. You know, you're already over here, so adding a couple missions here isn't going to provide much of a buffer. Uh, for that same reason, and also because the Apaches are generally hostile to the Spanish, there's not going to be much consideration, at least at this time, about establishing missions among the Apaches. Don't know the Wichita's very well at this point, so they're not even going to be considered. So the three places or the three Indian groups the Spanish are going to decide have to figure out um, who they should settle missions among are going to be the Caddos, the Coaltecans, and the Cronquas. Well, they look at a, a, a various information they have over these groups, and they're going to start ruling some of them out uh, pretty quickly, particularly the Caranquas. So the only contacts the Spanish had out of the Caranquas, Cabeza de Vaca, and then, you know, these these expeditions they had sent to, um, uh, you know, search for La Salle. They discovered the Caranquas had destroyed La Salle's fort, and basically almost all word they had about the Caranquas are, these guys are hostile. Not only that, but the Caranquas live along the coast, and by this point the Spanish realized that you know, even for Europeans who have immunities to uh, diseases or more immunities than American Indian people, if you're along the coast, there's a lot of mosquitoes in this area. It's generally very humid. Disease is uh, is going to be prevalent if we settle amongst the Caranquas. So they rule them out. They're going to look at Caddo's and the Coaltecans. Well, the Spanish are going to think Coaltecans, they're too different from us. Okay, and we've talked about this before, but the way they look at the Coltecans is they're nomadic. They're incredibly poor. They, um, you know, are moving from one place to another. It would take too much effort to missionize them. And by the way, they don't have large populations. Generally, you have smaller groups of a couple dozen people at most. Um, so they view the Coltecans as almost too different to establish missions among. All right, well, what about these Caddo's? Well, the, ca the Spanish had made contact with the Caddo's in 1680s while looking for La Salle. And when they were over here, they were incredibly impressed by the Caddo's. Now, again, the Caddo's aren't the same Caddo's we talked about in 1492. Uh, they'd suffered through periodic intervals of disease, and their population probably been reduced by 80, 90 percent by this point. But they're still incredibly impressive. When the Spanish went out here looking for La Salle, they found that the Caddo's had um, uh, huge cities still, cities of hundreds, even thousands of, of people at this point. Um, by the way, this is where you get the term Tejas. One of the groups they meet uh, uses the word Tejas, which was either referring to uh, the name of their group of, of Caddo's or it was a term for friend. Whatever the case, when the Spanish went amongst the Caddo's, they said, these people, in a lot of ways, are already like us. They're sedentary. They live in one place for a very long time and settled in, in major cities. What if we can take these Caddo cities and, through missionaries, essentially make them Spanish cities? Not only would that be easy, at least we think it's going to be easy, but it's right over here where we're worried about the French coming down and settle, settling. So this would be perfect from a strategic standpoint. So the Spanish will decide in 1690 to establish missions among the Caddo's. 1690, a um, soldier named Alonso de Leon and a priest named Damien Mazinet. You don't need to know their names, but they're going to set out with an expedition of soldiers and a handful of priests in order to establish missions among these Caddo's. Again, Caddo's, these beehive-style houses. Uh, and they're going to establish two missions uh, Santismo Nombre de Maria and San Francisco de los Tejas. Again, the word Tejas right there. Well, these missions aren't going to be um, uh, particularly big. Uh, basically, what the uh, priests are going to go in, they're going to bring European goods to these Caddo's. The Caddo's at this point hadn't had exposure to European goods. Um, you know, maybe they got a handful as uh, the uh, La Salle expedition members are making their way up to Canada. Maybe they'd gotten a handful from the Humanos trading with these groups over here, bringing them over there. 
but not very many. So when these missionaries come in and they're bringing things like iron pots, uh, arrowheads, or I'm sorry, steel they can use to make arrowheads, um, things like that, hatchets. Imagine if you just have a stone hatchet, somebody brings a steel hatchet, how much easier that would make your life. Well, missionaries bring these items, caddos, uh, basically they explain to, the, to these caddos, or at least attempt to explain to these caddos, we're just going to set up this church over here and we're going to try to uh, teach you some things. And the message isn't going to be entirely clear because they don't have uh, perfect uh, interpreters. So um, the Caddos initially allow the priests to settle there. Well, the soldiers who had accompanied the priests uh, up to East Texas, they're going to say, do you guys want me to stay with you? Well, the priests will say to the soldiers, no thank you. And the priests, what they're worried about here is that the soldiers will mistreat the local Indians. So they're going to say thank you, but no thank you. Leave a handful of soldiers, but we'll uh, handle things ourselves. Alright, so things go fine for the first little while among these caddos. You get a couple of these smaller missions. Uh, this would be a map from the time. I believe this is one of the missions. I believe that might be the other mission. And um, the missions look probably something like this. They're not going to get to the point where they're big. Um, maybe at, at their height it's going to be something like this. Okay, So they build this, build a, a small complex, and initially you're going to see some caddos coming into these missions and at least pretending to learn Christianity. Um, again, part of this is be probably because the priests are rewarding attending church with uh, European goods, stuff that the caddos don't have. What, and again, the Caddos don't have any other way to get these goods at this point. All right, well, af as uh, year one passes, the priests are going to start to run out of these European goods. They simply don't have that many. And because these missions are located all the way down, uh, all the way from these other settlements in New Spain, it's going to take a long time for goods to get up here. So there's going to be very few resupply missions. So these European goods aren't going to be coming at regular intervals. What is going to be coming on some of these supply trains, however, is disease. So very soon after the priests arrive, disease hits these caddos. Now there's probably been a couple waves of disease uh, run through the caddos before, but the priests are going to bring additional disease and there's going to be a, a, a smallpox outbreak among the caddos. So the caddos will start dying and um, and they're going to obviously blame the priests. You know, you guys show up and a year later we start to die. So uh, by 1693, the caddos of these two mission areas are going to tell the priests, you guys have to get out of here or we're going to kill you. So the priests, what they do is they're going to just go ahead and burn down their missions, bury their church bells, and they will uh, leave the caddos. Now, I should mention that as they're leaving the Caddos, um, uh, they return everything down here. The Spanish will set up the San Juan Batista. It initially, it's a presidio. Initially, it was planned as sort of a go-between between, between the East Texas missions and um, the rest of New Spain. Even though the East Texas missions are going to be abandoned in 1693, the Spanish still go ahead and build this presidio. They're still a little bit worried about the Spanish, or I'm sorry, the French coming down. So even if we don't have these missions, we, we at least should build some sort of buffer. Uh, and they build this buffer right on the Rio Grande uh, between what's today Texas and Mexico. So first attempt to settle in East Texas has been a failure. All right, well. You would think that, all right, we've got to make a second attempt really quickly. And the Spanish do, in the rest of the 1690s, consider a variety of ways to get settlers and missionaries back in East Texas. But something's going to happen in beginning in 1699 that will delay expansion into Texas for another uh, dozen-plus years. And that's going to be something called the War of Spanish Succession. Now, normally I don't like to talk about European affairs simply because they're boring, and you know it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of weird to think that something half a world away will have an effect on on people in Texas. But this War of Spanish Succession absolutely will. So, the War of Spanish Succession is going to begin with this guy. This guy's named Charles II. Well, Charles II was from the House of Habsburgs. Uh, 
basically the way that these Spanish monarchies worked is you would have these families and they claimed usually going back to after the fall of the Roman Empire that they were divinely ordained to rule others and the children of a monarch would pass I'm sorry the a monarch would pass his right to rule to his children and they would pass it to their children things like that well we've all seen Game of Thrones because the sort of this family lineage ties sometimes you would have these monarch families um, have incestuous relationships going on you would have you know first cousins marrying uh, sometimes you know brother sister things like that to keep the ruling within the family to keep the wealth within the family well the Habsburgs ruled Spain for a long time there had been a lot of inbreeding and by the way the Habsburg family also had ties to other royal families because a lot of way the monarchs monarchies would work is you would have one family marrying another and, and tying the families together so the Habsburg had some ties to um, the French and uh, these uh, Habsburgs that ruled Austria as well well this is going to be a big issue because in 1699 this King Charles II probably owing to inbreeding was um, uh, infertile he could not produce children um, actually you can kinda see some people think his unusual facial features might be uh, a product of in inbreeding whatever the reason Charles II was growing sick and he does not have a male heir to pass his, his uh, uh, crown down to well this is gonna make the here's another picture of Charles II this is gonna make France and Austria sorta of drool okay because because both of these monarchies have ties to Spain and what they think is if Charles II dies without a male heir then they can claim the Spanish Empire so if there's no legitimate uh, person to take over for Charles II um, France I'll claim let's say and I'm just making this up I'll claim Spanish possessions in South America Austria you take them in North America you know I'll take uh, the Philippines Austria you take the Caribbean or whatever they decide that if Spain falls because we're both related to the Habsburgs we have some claim to their crown I'll just say I'm the king of these Spanish possessions you say you're the king of these Spanish uh, possessions so 1699 as Charles lay dying France and Austria start partitioning out the Spanish Empire well Charles II is going to throw a wrench into these plans and this is going to be because he names uh, shortly before his death an heir so he says okay I don't have somebody to take over for me uh, I don't have a, a direct heir but you know who I do have I have this cousin this Philip the fifth Philip the fifth is a uh, uh, Taylor Swift looking gentleman here and Philip the fifth is the grandson of the King of France so think of him like uh, maybe Joffrey and um, Tywin Lannister or something they're they're very closely related well because he's directly related to the uh, monarch of France France says okay if my grandson is the king of Spain then I king of France and the king of Spain essentially this unites France and Spain under a single house so what France will determine is I don't need to make this deal with Austria because both Austria and France initially only had these broad ties to uh, uh, to Spain now they are, they're gonna have uh, France has this very close tie to Spain so what Spain in, in uh, it's gonna happen between Spain and France is we will see that their monarchies will essentially merge now they have different kings but they're so closely related that they're essentially going to start ruling one another uh, as a single empire so think of it for as 1700 to about 1715 or so we're gonna have Spain and France unite into a single kingdom so France, Frayne however you want to think about it 
this is uh, the uniting of these two kingdoms. Now, this is going to be a big deal because Spain and France are probably the two most powerful monarchies in the world. Okay, now this uh, England place up here, it, it's starting to catch up, and you know Austria is sort of uh, getting its stuff together, but Spain and France are at the top of things. France, you know, large population, uh, science, things like that. Spain, all the wealth of the New World, this large empire. You put these two together and basically they're going to dominate the world. Well, this gets the other monarchies of Europe freaking out and in particular England and Austria. Austria again angry that they got cut out of this deal. So what England and Austria are going to do is they will declare war on Spain and France, this newly united Spain and France, with an attempt to put a different monarch on the throne of France. So what we're going to see for the next 15 years is this world war uh, between uh, England, Austria, and other uh, European monarchies versus Spain and France and their combined empires. So this is going to have a lot of effects on the New World. A lot of these we're not going to talk about, but during this fighting we'll see Britain had already uh, taken some of these sugar islands from uh, Spain. It's going to take even more. Um, France, by the way, because Spain and France are going to be buddies for these next 15 years, uh, France is going to start you know, uh, uh, making treaties with Spain. It's going to give them favorable uh, uh, terms like for example France is going to take over this western half of Hispaniola uh, that Spain wasn't really using, this Haiti. So we're going to see this huge train change begin in the Caribbean during this War of Spanish Succession. Well the big thing that's going to happen for Texas is that with Spain and France being besties, you know, uh, their houses basically united, France is not going to have to worry about Spain attacking it while it settles down here in the lower Mississippi. So LaSalle had said this would be a great place to establish some colonies. France, you know, sent LaSalle. That one had failed. But hey, uh, now that we're buddies with, with Spain, we can just go ahead and settle anywhere we want in this area uh, without the Spanish having to worry about attacking us. And so what we'll see is... Um, uh, beginning 1700, the Spanish, I'm sorry, the French start settling all throughout Lower Louisiana here. Uh, a number of agricultural locations, places for trade coming down from Canada. That's going to be a big thing. We talked about it with LaSalle um, first, things like that coming down the Mississippi, then heading back out to Europe. And Spain isn't going to do anything about it because, again, their houses are essentially united. So we have France basically populating Louisiana in early 1700. Well, that's where this guy is going to come along. Um, Louis Jeshu de Saint-Denis. I apologize for my French pronunci pronunciation. But Saint-Denis is one of the first French settlers down here in Lower Louisiana. And he's going to come up with a plan. Basically, he decides that, all right, we're buddies, so the French aren't going to be taking over Spain's silver mines. But with all this Spanish specie, you know, meaning silver in particular, but some gold, we could probably get our hands on it, you know, if we could um, start trading with these silver mining areas down here. So we don't have to take anybody over because our, our countries are united. So uh, uh, we French, we could bring goods down here, furs, we can get, bring goods from Europe this direction or this direction and we can start trading them with these silver mines down here and they can trade us silver so we can get our hands on some of this silver uh, through trade. So Saint Denis, he establishes this town in Louisiana called uh, Natchitoches or he's about to, to establish that but he wants to set up this, um, this trade with uh, northern New Spain and get some of that silver. So what he will do is in 1715 he's going to travel down to uh, I'm sorry, 1713, he'll travel down to San Juan Batista, this newly built Presidio right on the border of what's today Texas and, and Mexico. And he's going to reach this Presidio commander, and he's basically going to show up. Initially, the commanders, hey, you know, who the heck is this weird French guy? But, you know, they're, again, their kingdoms are, are united at this point. And he's going to um, knock on the door of the Presidio. Again, not exactly how it happens, but imagine it that way. 
he'll uh, Presidio Commander will bring him in initially. He's like, what, what's this guy doing here? Well, Saint Denis is going to say, um, I have an idea. I would like to uh, propose that you resettle East Texas. I know you just had these uh, missions among the Caddos that had failed, but if you get these things started again, it would facilitate trade between uh, French Louisiana, which are newly established French Louisiana, and, and down here. I think it would be a fantastic idea. Well, the Presidio commander will send word down to Mexico City about um, St. Denis' proposal. Um, the Mexico City will say, thumbs up, this is a good idea. By the way, St. Denis, while he's down here in San Juan Batista, he marries the Presidio commander's daughter, um, and after word is uh, come that the uh, Spanish have approved of his plan they will release Saint Denis and he's going to return to Louisiana um, and he and his new wife will establish Natchitoches with the idea or Natchitoches I'm sorry Natchitoches with uh, the idea of um, having this trade between again uh, northern New Spain and Louisiana alright so that's the way things are going 1714 the Spanish are gathering these missionaries down here and telling them let's give these uh, missions in East Texas another shot so the missionaries start putting things together they are going to head up this direction in 1715 uh, to reestablish the missions among the Caddos in East Texas well by the time they get up here Saint Denis he's been gathering um, uh, support for this trade proposals over here in Louisiana he's gonna show up in East Texas having heard the missionaries are on their way and he's gonna show up and he's gonna say alright guys how can I help you know how can I help you guys build these new missions I wanna get this trade started well when Saint Denis shows up the Spanish are going to arrest him and Saint Denis is like whoa what's going on here I thought we were best buddies well what Saint Denis had not learned but the Spanish had learned is that in 1715 things had just changed and what had just happened in 1715 is that the British and the uh, the British and Austria had just won the war of Spanish succession basically the British they call themselves the British now but what had been England uh, in Austria they defeated the French and the Spanish and as a condition of being defeated the King of Spain changed to somebody that was not a direct relation to the King of France they're among the same houses these Bourbon uh, monarchs you don't need to know the exact name just yet but these Bourbon monarchs so they're kind of related but they're not directly related like they were before so what again the British and Austria do here is essentially split up this alliance between Spain and France. Now we're going to see because the their houses are somewhat related the Spanish and the French will uh, continue to uh, have good relations but they're not going to be united like they were for this period from 1700 to 1715 so they'll be occasional allies and if there's ever big war usually with Britain most of the time Spain's going to lie with France but they are also going to be um, adversarial as well so you know, more often allies but there's still also going to be conflict with one another so they're not united like they were for that 15 years from 1700 to 1715 so Saint Denis had not heard this the Spanish had and so when uh, he comes over here to you know um, uh, help these missionaries establish uh, reestablish missions in East Texas they have him arrested because hey we're enemies again Saint Denis will eventually get released. He's going to make his way back over here to Louisiana and live out a full life as a uh, trader and, and an agriculturalist over here in Louisiana. But um, for a brief period of time, he was detained by the Spanish. So now the Spanish really have to build these missions because once again, we are worried about the French possibly expanding in, into our silver mines. Now we're no longer buddies, so these missions have to work. So beginning in 1715, uh, and they're not going to actually be, begin construction until 1716, we will see these missionaries once again establish missions among the Caddos. Okay? Uh, and actually, kind of an interesting thing, and this is going to be something we'll talk about in a minute, as the missionaries are making their way up to East Texas, the Coal Tekans here are going to be going, hey, where are you guys going? We could use some missionaries. Spanish are saying, you guys are poor. We, uh, you know, we've got these caddos to get to, these wealthy caddos. 
that's who you want to settle, settle missions among. And so uh, th they'll sort of ignore the cold Tekkens at this point. Well, beginning in um, 1716, again, we start seeing these uh, missions established. Well, um, at this point, uh, we have one mission established at the previous site of one of the failed 1690 missions. We have one settled at what's today Nacogdoches. Um, we've got another one, present-day St. Augustine County. Uh, and then we have one, it's actually not in Texas today, it's a place called Los Ades. It's in, it's in the area of Louisiana. And Los Ades, kind of uh, unusually, would be selected as the capital of Texas. This was initially intended to be Texas, far east Texas was Texas. And so they thought Los Ades uh, will make it the most important city because as the main border with France, it is actually the most important city. So, all right, we've got these missionaries there. There's a handful of soldiers there to protect them. Not a whole heck of a lot of soldiers, again, because the missionaries uh, usually are nervous about soldiers being near the missions. So things get up and running, 1716. Well, just like last time, the missionaries are almost immediately going to face problems. One of the big problems is supplies. As we mentioned, getting supplies all the way from here, and a lot of these supplies come all the way from Europe and so they have to go through Veracruz make their way up here by the time they get up here they're going to be incredibly expensive and then resupply trips are going to be infrequent simply because there's no stopovers between San Juan Batista and uh, the missions in East Texas so goods quickly start to run out that's going to be one thing that upsets the Caddo's and for this reason once the goods start running out Caddo stop attending um, church and even when the goods don't uh, uh, continue to come in, cattos are not going to be going into the missions. They're not going to be, you know, growing the crops that the missionaries want. And essentially, they're just going to leave these missionaries on the outside of town because they have a different source of European goods that they didn't have last time in the 1690s. And that's going to be these uh, French mission or French traders. So as we talked about last time. The French, the way they operated is, they weren't interested in conversion, converting any. There's a handful of French missionaries, but most of the French are fur traders or just traders in general. And a lot of these guys would go into new areas, they would marry into Indian tribes, and they'd trade whatever they could for whatever products the Indians would give them that would sell back in Europe. A lot of times this is fur. Um, but even the Caddo's living in a warmer area didn't have any particularly good fur, but they do have certain items that you know the French can take back and sail off to Europe and, and make some money by selling these things to elites. So when the French show up among the Caddo's, they're going to start trading with them and give them European items for you know whatever furs, whatever the Caddo's have, pottery. And uh, they the Caddo's don't have to go to church to get these goods. Not only that, but the French traders are going to give them items that the Spanish are unwilling to give them. So the Spanish had policies where they did not trade firearms to Indians. They basically were worried that the fire, uh, Indians groups would turn the firearms against the Spanish, so they bit, did their best to keep firearms out of the hands of Indians. Spanish also didn't like to trade horses with Indians. Um, the French were willing to trade horses, and the French and uh, would trade alcohol, which in general the Spanish tried to keep out of the hands of Indians. So if you're the Caddo's and you have two choices, you can either attend church all day, you can either you know take Spanish lessons, you can either uh, do everything this priest is saying, that a lot of which goes against your normal way of life, or you can continue to hunt, um, you can uh, continue to grow the crops you want, you continue to live like you want to live, and then you just take whatever surplus goods you have and you trade it to this French trader that shows up at your village every couple months, uh, you're probably going to choose to deal with the French. So these new missions in uh, East Texas, they're not going to be kicked out like they were last time, at least not at least, but there are going to be even fewer caddos to show up at them than there had been before. So this is going to be the case here, 1716 until about 1718. It's at this point we're going to get a new mission established in Texas. So missions over here, not a lot of people coming into them, priests just sort of hanging out. 
Well, 1718, Spain is still worried about getting supplies up here uh, because it's such a long distance between San Juan Batista and these East Texas missions. Well, the Viceroy of Mexico is going to determine, all right, the way we can solve this is we can have a settlement midway between San Juan Batista, or at least close to midway between San Juan Batista and the East Texas missions. And the uh, Viceroy and some missionary leaders, some uh, Catholic Church leaders, will determine, hey, remember when we were traveling up here, there were these Coaltecans that were asking for missionaries? Maybe they'd be good to settle missions among. Uh, as we've talked about before, the Coaltecans, not an organized group, you know, certainly not like the Caddos that, um, you know, the Caddos, even though there are multiple different Caddo groups under different leaders, they all spoke common language, shared very similar culture. The Coaltecans are just sort of small groups of hunter-gatherers. They live a very poor lifestyle. They, um, you know, constantly searching for food. As we've talked about, some of this food isn't particularly appetizing. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, deer poop, lizards, spiders, things like that. So life had never been great for the uh, Coaltecans. What had become even worse in the late 1600s, early uh, 1700s, because of the Apaches. So the Apaches had been on this uh, expansion, especially in the 16, late 1600s, when more horses started getting into the plains. And a lot of these Apaches would start expanding their raiding sphere, and this included attacking these Coaltecans down here in this region. So already sort of a poor lifestyle, now you've got to face the threat of occasional Apache raids. So the Coaltecans with this poor lifestyle, they want missionaries because missionaries mean protection. They not only mean European goods, but they mean, hey, we'll, we'll get a couple soldiers in here uh, with the missionaries, they'll protect us from these Apaches. And so the Coaltecans will be asking for missionaries and the Spanish will decide because they're building this uh, supply route that we're going to oblige them with a mission in 1718. So a handful of missionaries show up in 1718. There will actually be a presidio established nearby. And what we're going to get is the founding of San Antonio. Basically the day they show up is St. Anthony's Day and so they name it San Antonio. And so we have this mission established among the Coaltecans. Well, the San Antonio mission is going to be very different than the missions in East Texas. Nobody had showed up to the missions in East Texas because Caddo's are living a perfectly fine life. Uh, they're not being raided by the Apaches. Um, now they're getting goods from the French. No reason to listen to these Spanish priests. The Coaltecans, on the other hand, if I don't have these Spanish priests, I'm going to get killed by the Apaches, and so they will help the priests construct a church, um, and we'll see th this first mission, San Antonio de Valero, it'll later be the, the Alamo, uh, will be constructed with uh, un under the or, uh, instruction of the Spanish priests. So uh, eventually, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, you'll have this whole mission complex, the way it would operate is the priests would take up residents and um, uh, these priest cells. They'd have a church where uh, you would go to church and every evening during the day. Uh, Indians would go out to the fields and work growing European style crops. At night they return to the mission complex and sleep and slowly they begin this process of um, Hispanicization. Okay? And this mission is going to be protected by a presidio established nearby. Again, a lot of times uh, priests are hesitant to have soldiers nearby. But in this instance, the Coaltecans actually want the support of the soldiers because they'll uh, protect them against Apaches. So we now have this settlement halfway in between, and this mission's somewhat successful. All right, well, that's how things are in 1719 when something is going to happen that will lead a number of these missions here in East Texas to be abandoned yet again. Again, 1719, very few cattles are showing up to these things. They're getting the goods they need from the French. They're fine without the Spanish. Well, 1719, there will be a war breaking out in Europe between the French and the Spanish. And in, during this war, the... Uh, uh, word is going to arrive over here in French Louisiana. Spain and France are at war. This is going to lead a handful of people here from Natchitoches 
Nakatish, sorry, I always, uh, always uh, pronounce it by its, uh, the way it looks instead of the way it's actually pronounced. But a handful of French people and soldiers from Natchitoches will hear the French and Spanish are at war. So these French soldiers are going to decide, well, since we're at war with the Spanish in Europe, let's just go ahead and take some of this area over here, these newly established missions. And so a handful, and when I say a handful of French soldiers, I mean less than a dozen. It's just uh, uh, six, seven, we don't know the exact number, but something like six or seven French soldiers uh, and settlers will come from Natchitoches in June 1719 with the idea of first scouting out, not even actually initially taking these missions, but just scouting out just to see how much Spanish uh, presence the Spanish have in East Texas. And they are going to uh, cross over again June 1719, and they're going to come upon Los Ades. Well, they approach the mission. Um, a chicken is going to be outside the mission, and we're, this is going to be called the Chicken War. It's the most unwarlike war possible because the whole extent of this war is basically going to be the French approach the mission, a chicken squawks, it's going to scare the, the French commander's horse, the horse is going to throw the French soldier off, the uh, sound of the French soldier falling off his horse is going to alert the priest at the Los Ades mission, and the one soldier that's uh, guarding the priest, again not many soldiers in these East Texas mission, they're going to see these French soldiers, they're going to think that this is just a small party for a larger group, so this is just half a dozen or so guys, but there's probably a couple more dozen ready to come up on us. And what this uh, the soldier and the priest are going to do is they're going to start running off, they're going to run to these other Spanish missions, and they're saying, the French are invading, let's get the heck out of here, guys. And so in 1719, we get this chicken war. And again, there are no paintings of this chicken war because this thing isn't really much of a war so the only thing I've got is this uh, family guy photo of uh, uh, Peter fighting a chicken again not even you know if it was chickens fighting somebody that'd be a much better war than uh, than what the chicken war actually was so just know that 1790 Spanish thinking the French are about to invade uh, flee East Texas. All these Spanish missions in East Texas are banned. Again, the Caddos don't care. They weren't going to the missions anyway. And so uh, what we'll see is all these missions are uh, at leave and they're all going to flee down here to San Antonio in 1719. Well, they get down here in, in San Antonio in 1719 and they're going to find that, wait a minute, um, you guys are saying that you, the Coaltecans are actually attending the missions. They're going to see Coaltecans uh, in San Antonio de Valero, um, you know, starting to grow these crops. Even though, again, Coaltecans are very different than the Spanish. Uh, they like the Spanish protection. They see them start to learn Spanish, starting to uh, become Hispanicized. And the rest of these missionaries that have left this region are going to say, well, you know what? Are there other groups around here that are like you, Cold?" Uh, Coltecans, and again, this is just one group of Coltecans that had gone into San Antonio missions in 1718. Other Coltecan uh, groups are saying, we want missions as well. So what the Spanish will do is basically they'll send out word to uh, Coltecans in the neighboring area, hey, if you guys will come into missions here, then we'll establish our missions among you, amongst you guys. And so what happens is all of these missions that were supposed to be in East Texas they basically relocate to the San Antonio River amongst the Coltecans. So this is an older map. Um, if you uh, see, I think there's uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so the four missions are going to relocate. We're going to see one group of missionaries go back to East Texas. We'll talk about that in just a minute. I believe this would be the Presidio right here. And so Coltecans from neighboring areas, uh, different groups will get their own mission. If you ever go to San Antonio today, um, the Alamo is basically the first stop on what they call this mission trail. You can go to all these different missions. Um, some of them are outside of San Antonio. Um, some of them are, uh, Alamo is obviously within the main part of San Antonio. But you just go down the river and you'll see these other missions. And each of them is going to have their own group of uh, Coaltecans. Um, and as we're going to talk about, the priests are going to say, well, what's the point in going back to the East Texas with the cattle that don't care about us? 
why not stay among these um, these East Texans? Well, Spain wants to protect East Texas, doesn't want France to expand, so they're basically going to insist that some missionaries uh, go back to Los Ades, reestablish a mission there. By the way, this is the official capital of Texas, even though we're going to see that the population is going to be um, here, um, but but uh, so the capital will essentially be San Antonio, but in name it's going to be Los Ades for a while. Uh, but uh, um, uh, but in this governor is going to end up serving out San Antonio because this is where the missionaries are. This is where the Hispanicized Indians are. And when we do see civilian settlers start moving up uh, to join these uh, the priests and the Hispanicized Indians and the Spanish soldiers, they're all going to come to San Antonio. Uh, but in 1721, there will be some missionaries return to Los Ades, and there'll be a presidio established alongside them. But no Caddos are going to come to the Los Ades mission simply because they didn't want them in the first place. They um, are getting goods from the French. So the Spanish reestablished the Los Ades mission, but I don't even want you to think about it as a mission because no Indians are going to show up. Maybe a handful of Caddos. Uh, over the whole course of uh, Los Ades from 1721 to later when we talk about uh, Los Ades being abandoned. So officially Los Ades is reestablished, but just think of it as a handful of missionaries and some Presidio soldiers. Very small town, and in capital in name, but in reality the capital will be in uh, San Antonio. Uh, again, San Antonio... Uh, these missions are going to start growing as initial Coatecan groups start uh, living in the area. This is a uh, picture of the San Juan Batista mission. If you ever go uh, travel along the San Antonio Trail, what you'll see is um, basically um, um, uh, better missions than you see at the Alamo. The Alamo does not look like it looked at at the peak of its um, you know the mission period. But uh, some of the missions have been recreated along the mission trail. So if you go down there, you'll see these full missions, the way they were initially operated. Again, San Juan Batista, this is where people attend church. This is where the priests live. Uh, Indians lived in these areas out here. You had blacksmith shops here. Uh, some Indians lived in tents uh, that would be sent up in this area and then go out and, and uh, plant in the fields out, outside of town. So... We now have the main settlements of Texas in 1721, uh, which is again going to be San Antonio, Los Ades, kind of San Juan Batista. Again, we'll come back to talk about El Paso a little bit later. What we're going to talk about next time is Texas growing, and then we're going to talk about the people of Texas, what the people of Texas lived like in the mid-1700s.